late. It's around seeing people that haven't been here. So it's, uh, it's a blessing to see some people back. So we bless you to have Becky back with us and Evan. Uh, you can pray for them if you would. And, uh, Frank and Shirley are back today. You can pray for their help. And uh, Ms. Robbins is here. So it's good to see some people back this morning. And uh, we had a great time in the men's prayer advance this past week. And appreciate the prayers there. And uh, as far as I know, we all got, all got back uh, without any sickness. So, knock on wood. So, uh, so we're thankful for that as well. And uh, let's open a word of prayer as we begin the service this morning. Father, we just come before you today. And we're just thankful to Father for the opportunity truly to come into your house and to be able to learn more about you and to, to appreciate you more. And I pray, your Father, that you would just uh, be with each one that's here today. That you would just help them to have come with their hearts prepared. And if they're, they didn't, your Father, I pray you help us to take this time even now just to ask you, your Father, as Alan mentioned in Sunday school, to invite you in, your Father, to be able to speak to our hearts. And we know that you're wanting to. We know that you're willing to. And uh, that you don't want us to leave here unchanged. And so we just pray that you would uh, do that work, your Father, within us. And we ask, your Father, that you would do it. And that uh, we might become more like you even here this morning. And I pray that the truths that will be shared, the blessings that will be shared, that you would uh, just use them in our lives, your Father, to uh, awaken our hearts, your Father, more so towards you. And I pray that you would be the our soul's satisfying hope, your Father, in this world. And so we just pray that you would just receive all of the glory, everything that's said, everything that's done here today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would stand and we turn to page number 243. Page 243. Page 243.
said. So continue to pray for Brother Wright. And uh, we're, um, our goal is to have our business meeting on February the 10th in that evening service. So keep that in mind. And so that's our goal. So uh, we're trying to get there. And I, we were supposed to have had our meeting this past week, and I wasn't feeling well. And so anyway, I think we're all taking turns. But uh, we're going to run out of weeks. So anyways, we praying that um, we'll be able to have that. And so for the fellows, our, our goal is to have that on Tuesday, the 29th there at 2. Just keep that in mind. Uh, also, the men's prayer can occur. <laughs> Prayer breakfast. Um, it can be just as good. <laughs> uh, coming up uh, February the second on that Saturday at eight thirty. So keep that in mind. If you'd like to come and help uh, beforehand, be here at seven forty-five. So keep that in mind. Just want to encourage you guys to come out to that. And uh, I know we're kind of down on that a little bit uh, as far as attendance uh, lately. So continue to, uh, to come out to that. And it's uh, you know it's it's really in the end it's just a it's a good time of fellowship, but it's also a good time of just prayer, just you know, bringing the petitions of our church and, and our own personal needs uh, for the Lord and uh, just spending some time together with other brothers. And so continue to pray for that and come out and support it if you would. Uh, also, our adult Valentine's Day is coming up February the 8th on that Friday evening at 6.30. And the cost is $10 a person. And uh, you can see Miss Janice Ritchie or Dorothy Nelson uh, for the tickets. They actually have the tickets, so you can see them and pay them and deal with it that way. Um, also, if you'd like to know what we're eating, it might be a good idea. Uh, we do have the menu on the bulletin board out in the hallway, so keep that in mind there. You can, uh, it's some good items, by the way. It's not sloppy joes. So, and uh, so anyway, you can take a look at that. Um, so we're also going to have a skit. Um, yeah. All right. Person smile is going to do the skit, so I guess that's on. Uh, and then also uh, we're going to be having the white elephant gift game, and if you'd like to bring an item for that for the exchange, you value around ten dollars or so. Uh, that would be great. We always have a good time with that. So keep that in mind. That's again. Excuse me. I'm not on that white elephant gift. Oh. It doesn't need to be something new. It be oh. something you got me at. Bring something that you would want, though. I don't <laughs> 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 anyway, okay, I'll leave that alone. All right, um, and then also we do have out in the uh, hallway on the bulletin board, uh, Jennifer put up the, um, in your bulletin down, down there at the bottom, BBC service opportunities. And there's different things around the church where uh, if you'd like to be involved to help, um, uh, there's more than enough things there uh, to be able to sign up for if, you're, if you'd like to be involved. Um, also mentioned this a few weeks ago, uh, whenever the ladies had their meeting, um, if, you're, if you've been doing something and you'd like to do something else, that's perfectly fine too. It's not a life sentence. You know, there's different things that you've maybe been doing for years in the church. So if you'd like to do something else, that's perfectly fine. So anyway, that's what that list is for. And if you'd like to be able to help out with some different areas and uh, needs here in the church, we uh, greatly appreciate it. So we'll keep that thing, those things before you.
blessing to know that he is forever ours, isn't it? Amen. Let's get around and take this time to fellowship with one another.
defines times and is determined. It defines what Christianity is meant to be. Our God is not altering. Our God is not evolving. He does not change. He does not lie. There is no shadow of turning in him. He is rock-like. Our God is not moved. It's us that have moved. We have moved and we've lost sight of the rock. You build upon anything else, it will fail you when the winds and the rains come and beat against your house. The Iron Shock. The Iron Shock is officially classified as extinct. It's sort of hard to give an accurate understanding of how big this animal is. At the top of its brow, it's about 10 feet tall. On top of its 10 foot tall head, it had a rack of antlers that spanned 12 feet in width. 12 feet! That's bigger than Goliath! Just on top of his head! Yet it went up five more feet! 15 feet of massiveness! What I'm looking at here is something that I would liken to true Christianity. Christianity the way God intended it to be. We love seeing that elk are majestic creatures! They stir us for some reason. There's something about an elk that is moving. They're a regal animal. However, what's the height of an elk, would you guess? I mean, would we say five, six feet would be the top of the head? Maybe? This is so big, right? Rack of antlers, maybe a couple feet above that. Who might get up to eight feet? You take a modern-day elk and stand it next to an iron shark. You were really impressed with the modern-day version, weren't you? Our problem is we've lost sight of the Irish elk version of Christianity. We don't even believe it exists. We honestly believe it's our extent. We don't go after it. God doesn't intend to do those things in a manner of one of God. And that was what he did back then. Those are things for yesteryear, not for today. You see, we need a rack of antlers. Something that causes the world to stop their car, slam into a ball. When I was studying extinct animals, this is what it said. Despite being officially classified as extinct, sightings are still reported. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if sightings are still being reported, shouldn't you remove or change the classification of extinct? What does extinct to you mean gone? No more? No more. You see, this is Christianity. This is what God wants to bring back here. You see, what we say is, despite being officially classified as extinct, true Christianity, Brawny, Christianity, the type of Christianity that stands on a rock and is unmoved in their generation, the type of Christianity that knows the power of their God, George Mueller's their way through to support a thousand orphans, to grow them up merely on faith, to extraordinary pictures that have been exemplified throughout Christianity, C.T. Stunt going to the 52 and dying by goes into the heart of Africa, untamed. are these men? They were Irish elk. Let's behold the majesty again, fall flat on our face, recognize our uncleanness and the uncleanness of the system around us, and allow our God to clothe us in his blood. Allow our God to cleanse us with his blood. Allow our God to regenerate us, to set our feet upon a rock, to make us tributes to his glory.
to through lives wholly submitted to him. And may this generation see what elk are supposed to look like. so much for thanking of us and showing us your love and support. We pray the Lord will bless you and keep you and do mighty things through you in the year 2019. Your servants in Wales, David and Mary Campbell. Uh, this morning, a missionary letter is from Marcos and Stephanie Lindsay, a missionaries to Peru. Dear faithful supporters, Happy New Year. We had a great finish to 2018 in our church is doing well. Stephanie and the baby are great, and the Lord is providing for us in amazing ways. By the time we write again, we will add, have added another one to our family. Stephanie is due to deliver the baby on February the 8th. I'm preparing to leave. Now, get an idea. I'm going to read this as if it hadn't happened, but it has. He wrote this letter in either late December or early January. And I think some of you might remember some of the snow issues that we had around here. Well, he wasn't immune from that de uh, either. But the Lindsay's are on a five-month uh, furlough. And as part of the beginning of this furlough, uh, uh, Marco says, I'm preparing to leave for a 10-day trip to the East Coast. Savannah will be staying with Mom, and the rest of the girls will be joining me for the meetings. Uh, we are excited about the trip just not the prospect of, snowy, of a snowy drive. Now, they were actually supposed to come see us during this 10-day trip. It didn't happen. I think uh, because of the snow, the weather, the pastor was in direct contact with Marcos, and it uh, just didn't work out for him to be able to get here. Um, now, it goes on. Caitlin and, Caitlin and Alyssa, will be uh, bringing their schoolwork <coughs> with them, so please pray for them. What they want, they want the kids to be able to continue to do their schoolwork while they're on the trip, because they want some time off, because Caitlin will be headed off to Heartland Baptist College in the fall. So they want their schooling to be finished on time, get their work done even while they're on furlough, and be able to spend a little bit of time uh, with Caitlin before she has to head off to uh, college. Uh, brother Jesu, is still preaching for me at the Glista uh, Baptist. Peppy is by his side and does some errands and is learning about the ministry as he teaches the youth. Last Sunday, oh, this is great, last Sunday we were just over 100 people. They helped us put on a fairly elaborate Christmas program and it was extremely well attended. He also asked us to pray. He says, just around the corner, and I guess by the time they get back, uh, that the camps and the vacation Bible schools will be coming up. And he's asking that both uh, Jesu and Pepe will continue uh, in the ministry and mature in their teachings. Now he has a family. This is a family of five brothers. It's the Panaya family, uh, and they're located in San Geronimo. There were five men that had been coming to the services on a fairly regular basis, and it's gotten to the point lately, just before he left, that they had slowed down in their attendance. He asked us to pray for him because he knows that job situations and studying with some of the courses that they've been taking is having a hindrance on it. So he asked us to pray for this family uh, that they will be able to work out those conflicts and be able to get back in church. He also says, please pray for a couple of men that I witnessed to while here in Indiana. 
Uh, one is Christopher Evans. He is very interested to speak about, um, to me about his doubts and his struggles. Now, this is a fellow that had been addicted to drugs and alcohol, and uh, Marcos was able to spend a great deal of time with him and talk to him and witness to him about the Lord. And he looks like there's going to be some opportunities for him to follow up. A man has not accepted the Lord yet, but the door is open, and Marcos asked us to pray uh, for Christopher in that respect. And uh, there's also a Mexican man by the name of Juan that he's met there as well. And uh, he said that he didn't make it to our church services during the Christmas program, but he invited me back to his church. So he's all, already talked to Juan and invited him to the church, and that door is open as well. Um, he says, while on furlough, we'll be staying uh, in a home provided by Lifeline Baptist Church in Indianapolis. This is where my brother Tim is pastor. The Lord has provided a lot of clothes for the coming baby uh, and the Christmas gift. Uh, he said, thank you for the Christmas gift and for the great blessings. And uh, he is saying, what a great God that we serve. And uh, he says, there are many things that they want to do. They're already planning, they're here on furlough, and they're already planning of what they're going to do when they get back to <clears throat> uh, Peru and their church in Bucana. One of the things that they want to do, they have raised $2,000 out of the $3,500 need uh, to put new flooring in the sanctuary. So what they're going to do, and one of the first things there is when they get back, they're going to be able to stake that $2,000 and buy the material. But he says the wood is going to have to dry out for quite some time. So maybe even as much as a couple of months. And Barney could probably uh, help him with that. But uh, they got to let that wood dry for quite a bit of time before they, uh, after they purchase it, before they put it down in the sanctuary. And he said he's pray for them that they're going to do that in hopes during that period of time they can raise the rest of the money that they're going to need uh, for getting the wood ready and the installation of that wood into the sanctuary. So he asked us to pray about that. But there he is, already looking ahead uh, for what he's going to do. And they'll be headed back uh, from that furlough on April the 10th. Uh, he also asked us to pray for their death ministry. This is one that he mentions, I think, in just about every letter that he sends us, that they have a death ministry, and he wants us to, to be in prayer for that. He says, we're looking forward to going home. But the Lord has things for us to do here. Please pray for our safety, for our patience, and for us to live as pleasing to the Lord. Thank you for your prayers, Marcos and Stephanie Lindsay. So, as you can see, there's always, with all of our missionaries, there's a lot of traveling going on, weather issues, babies coming on board. And it was really funny that he put in here, he, uh, they haven't told us the name of the baby yet, but he names everybody in the family, and at the bottom he says, and pray for Junior. So we don't we don't quite know who Junior yet, but uh, wants us to pray for the baby in that delivery in February. So keep Marcos and his family and all of our missionaries in your prayers. Thank you. All right. Well, if you would stand, we're going to sing our last congregational together. Page two oh eight. Page two oh eight. Grace greater than our sin.
he works at our hearts. He wants to work at our hearts each day. And uh, this time what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, um, and ask the fellows to come. And, uh, uh, Larry and, and uh, Brother uh, Bill and, um, and Brother Allen and, when, and I went to the uh, Prince Prayer Advance. So we're going to ask them to come and just give a uh, word of testimony about the week and how the Lord spoke to their hearts. Morning, church family. How are you today? This was the 30th annual Men's Prayer Advance that uh, didn't know going there this year that it was the 30th, but it was the 30th. And uh, what a blessing it is to know that all of these men, Harold Bond has had this ministry going on for 30 years. I've been fortunate enough to go now. This is my fourth or fifth time that I've gone. And every time I go, I just feel blessed um, to be with 850 men this year. 850 men from all over. They were from 13 different states, from Arizona, Texas, Illinois, New York, all over. All came down to worship our Lord and Savior. And um, to be a part of that is something special. Um, just now, we were singing this song at the Men's Prayer Advance. And if you can just imagine, again, these 850 men Probably 840 of them can't sing a leg. <laughs> but, but together, we can still make a praise with our singing to our Lord and Savior. And it's just something to be a part of. Um, and we do it for almost an hour, nonstop, song after song. It's really something that's not easy to do. Even if by the time you're done, you feel like you're in a marathon. Um, and it's just a reminder um, that, uh, especially for the men, that uh, uh, we all struggle with different things in our life. And uh, as men, we can relate to one another um, and share those experiences and how the Lord's worked it out in our life or, or not. Uh, a couple of men gave testimonies. I'll tell you, there were some pretty uh, heart-tugging uh, ones that uh, were brought out. Um, Harold does such a fine job of picking the speakers. The speakers are just a blessing. They really come um, to revive us. We go there to get revived. It's a revival for men. So, uh, you know, um, I wrote down a bunch of notes. Uh, the three things that I uh, wanted to achieve with the men's prayer advance was uh, to get revived. I went there to get uh, my spirit lifted again, uh, to give me uh, refreshment. Uh, to, to refresh my spirit and my soul with uh, brothers in Christ for our Lord. And then to get restored, you know, to be able to surrender my sins, make sure I'm cleaning myself up. Um, we should be doing it on a daily basis, but sometimes we, we, we lack it. And this gives us the time to really focus on it, to sit and just say, Lord, you know, I'm leading this life, and this is where I'm at. You know where I'm at. He just wants me to tell him where I'm at. And sometimes that's um, the biggest part. It's us admitting our sin and uh, confessing it to our Lord. Um, one of the things they talked about was um, uh, knowing our calling. You know, again, the Lord has blessed everyone here sitting here with our calling. And to find what your calling is, to praise our Lord. To give Him what He, you know, this is what He created us for. It's all different. All, you know, Pastor is calling us to preach. Alan's is to teach. But each one of us here has a calling. And we're supposed to do it with love for the Lord. And do it with for the Lord and enjoy doing it. You know, mine's cooking in the kitchen. I can't tell you. I really enjoy doing that. It's a real blessing to be able to do that for the Lord and have a joy of doing it. So, um, leadership in our own homes. Again, another thing. As a man... Our responsibility is to be the leader of our families, and not, a, not an easy thing to do, especially if um, we have loved ones in our family that are not saved. It's, uh, it's a constant struggle. There's a stumbling block there, you know. Uh, the devil likes to use our family against us. So, um, And then one of the quotes that um, they said, um, 
is our vision, and why would we? Why would anybody in our family want to follow God if God is not enough in our own lives? Pretty powerful. You know, we have to be that role model. Um, when things are not going well, how do we uh, react to the situations? And they're watching. Boy, our family is watching us closer than anybody else. And um, so our, our job is, as the men, is to be the leader of the family. And uh, so again, I just wanted to uh, not take up all the, the, the talking points, leave some for the other guys, but it's a true blessing. I love going with my brothers in Christ, with Bill and Alan and Justin. Great time of fellowship. Um, and then again, just to be with all of these different guys from every different walk of life, all experiencing something different, but uh, singing and praising our Lord. So, uh, thanks. Some miracles. I think somebody had gotten fed. The five thousand were fed, and then mm -hmm. the disciples got on the boat and they went across, and the storm came. Jesus wasn't there. He, he stayed back to pray. And how did he get to them? Walked on the water, right? And out of all of those disciples on that boat, right? How many asked to do the same thing? One person. Did he get to Peter, right? That's right. He said, I want to walk back. Lord, I want to do that. And that's impossible. We know that we can't do that, right? But Peter walked on water. There's a point there for us, right? He had to ask. That's right. And we need to ask the Lord for all those things in our life that are necessary in our mind. We have stuff in our heart, right, that we'd like to have happen to our lives, to the world. That's right. But James tells us that we have not because we ask, ask not. We need to ask anything possible. Somebody talked about that last year, too. One of the gentlemen who spoke here this year it was the same, totally different verses. But ask the impossible in your life, in your family's life, in the church. Ask for the impossible. Pray. But pray to leave, right? That's right. But not with a split mind. Or, because a person that doesn't have a mind set on one way in mind, that you don't receive anything. So you, you 
stories that are often hilarious. Boy, does he ever bring Bible truth out That's in right. those stories. And the last one that we heard, it was so funny, Larry was crying. <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually had an audience watching him. <laughs> but it was just hilarious. <clears throat> he brought out stories. Now, we talked about that in one of That's about biblical. Tell stories to make a point. Um, Jesus did. Stories and bring up Bible truths, and I enjoyed that. The trip there was not good. I got sick in the back of the van, and uh, Bill changed places with me so that he could get sick in the back of the van. <laughs> and then the pastor got sick in the back of the van. I don't know what was back there. I never got had to sit back there. But it was great. Um, it was wonderful. I, I don't know if it can still be good. You know, I went first year and it just blew me away. And I was not revived. And I, I still am from that first time. And then last year I went and I said, wow, that just is good. And then I went this year and I, my verdict after the first day was, that part way through the second day I went, you know, it's not quite as good as By the time I left, I went, wow, it's just good. Preaching about the Lord, but you know something? The Holy Spirit got invited me. That's right. I made that point earlier this morning, Sunday school. Yep. Invited him in on Sunday school to God. To your heart. You're not responsible for the person beside you. you for you, ask. If you want the blessing, ask. And there's so much blessing there. Joy, praise, men crying and shouting, but not craziness. They weren't like climbing their pews and backing back from each other. But they were happy. There was joy, conviction, cleansing. And you come back and you do it all over again. It was just joy in the Lord. It's wonderful. You know? We can have that here. That's right. We can have that in your home. That's right. It's not really a great thing. That's right.
time that I've ever asked the Lord to speak to my heart uh, in a real and genuine way, I've never come away disappointed. And I would say that you would you will never either. Philippians chapter 4 here, and the title of the message this morning is just simply, what is the secret to being totally content? What is the secret to being totally content? And there's a lot of different things that the Lord spoke to my heart about this week, and there's a lot of different things I would say that probably in each one of our lives uh, that would that where we be, can become uncontent. Um, and you know, to be honest with you, for me, it's uh, I'd like to see a bigger church. I'd like to see more people. I'd like to see us grow. Uh, the on uh, Friday evening, he talked about. Um, as far as his, the sermon was basically focused around uh, praying for the impossible. And uh, 
That's basically <coughs> my prayer, is that the Lord will just continue to help our church to grow and to flourish beyond the generations that sit out here, beyond, beyond my generation. You say, well, why? Because this is his church. We should want it to flourish. And uh, there's, so there's just many things that we talked to uh, that, that were brought out. But this, as far as being totally content, um, content in the Lord and realizing that our total co contentment in this world is only going to be found in Him. You say, well, how, how, do we, how do we know that? How do we know that that contentment is only going to be found genuinely in Him? And I would say that, first of all, because everything else, we have to continually go back to it for supposed contentment. Those who have a problem with drugs or alcohol, why do they keep going back to those things? Because it's unfulfilling. It's not, it does not fulfill the void. They're not content if that's what they're following after. Uh, it was mentioned uh, a big problem today for men is pornography. Why do, why do men keep going back to it? Because they're not content. They're looking for contentment in all the wrong ways and all the wrong things. And as Christians, we would have to ask the question, why is God not our sole contentment? And I would say it's ultimately because we have other things in the way. And for your heart or my heart, it might be different things. But you know, the, Satan knows where to not only discourage us, we talk about that quite often, but he also knows where to get us discontent. He also knows what to put in our way that gets our minds and our hearts off of him. And it can be just solely, it might not even be anything necessarily like blatantly sinful. But you know, sin is really ultimately doing something that's not pleasing to God. That's really the, the, the uh, bare bones definition. And even if we're not doing anything for him, that's also sinful. And why would we not be doing anything for him? Because we're not, we don't find contentment in him. We don't find satisfaction in him. And so here this morning, just in the few moments that we have, we just wanted to look briefly here on in this thought is what is the secret of being totally content? And there was here in the in the chapter, Philippians 4, beginning in verse 10 through verse 13. Here's Paul talking to the church of Philippi, and he says these words. He says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. He goes on and says, I know how to be amazed. And I know how to abound. There, when you talk about being abased, you talk about getting knocked off your horse whenever you're the crown of the crown in Judaism and, and you're marching Christians off to be killed or at least in prison and you get knocked off your horse and you become blind by the Lord. That's pretty much being abased. And he says, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. And he goes on and says, Every, everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, but to abound and to suffer need. Both to abound and to suffer need. And then how does he end this? He ends it in a very familiar portion of scripture that we can almost all quote in our sleep, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And here, think about this as he begins this whole point there in verse 10. But I rejoice the Lord greatly now that, and, and he talks about how that, uh, how that they wanted to do more for Paul and they lacked opportunity. He says in verse 11, now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. 
Paul didn't look for in his life areas of just bounty and realizing that, okay, this is, this is basically God's blessing. If everything's going well, then, then I must be blessed. And then to only be content when things are going well. If that was Paul's life, then he would probably just be huddled up next to a tree, sulking for the rest of his life. But that's not what Paul did. Paul goes on in, in a few different times in the New Testament and goes through all the different things that have happened to him. If it happened to you or me, the average individual, if we're not abounding in Christ, if, if our contentment is not truly in Christ, we would have probably given up. One beating would have probably have done it. But yet we see how that he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was stoned almost to death. He was in prison multiple times. But they didn't have cable and three hots and a cot. He was in a dungeon. And yet he says, and what's his basically uh, coming away statement there. His thought was at the end in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need for I have learned in whatever state I am. It doesn't matter what's going on around him, whether it's a good, good time in his life or a terrible time in his life as we would look at it. He says uh, to be content. To be content no matter what's going on around us. So we would say that what's the secret of being content? Ultimately, it's that it's not in what we have. It's not in our position in life. It's, it's not even whether food's going to be on the table or the rent's going to be paid. If that's all your contentment's found in, it's very shallow. But Paul's found that his contentment ultimately and totally was in, found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And whenever it's found in Christ, that no matter what's going on around us in our life, it's not going to basically shake us away from our faith in Him. And that's really what's going on here. And this is what Paul's dealing with. And he goes on in verse 12 and says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned, both how to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then, because he's content in Jesus Christ, in him alone, then he can come to verse 13 and truly say, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. So here, you know, we, we look at the Apostle Paul and we put him up on this pedestal at times, maybe in our minds, as far as Christianity even, and he's way up here and we're like at such a lofty goal to become like Paul or to become like some of these other disciples of Christ that even gave their life for him. But we can have this same relationship with God that Paul had. That's what God wants from us. He doesn't want this, you know, starting to be like Paul. That's not our goal. You never find that in, in the New Testament. It's Paul constantly admonishing the readers to become more like their savior. Mm -hmm. That's who our goal, and that's who we should be modeling our, our life after. So here, first of all here is, is that the secret of, of being totally content is to rejoice in your substance. Realizing that the things that the Lord gives to us, to be totally content in it, whatever lot in life that is. Sometimes that can be very difficult. Uh, many of you that are here uh, going through a lot of different troubles right now, whether it be health, most of it's health, uh, with individuals that are even here this morning. But you know, if Jesus Christ is truly our soul, uh, solstice and our, our life, and, and he, we realize that he's our sustainer, truly, and that's really what's going to get us through. So here, our, he's our substance. God, we have to understand that God knows our every need. Right. Sometimes we forget that fact, don't we? Uh -huh. 
He knows everything that's going on around us in our life. He also, to re regardless of what God provides, rejoice in it. You know, sometimes I think that we only give God praise whenever we see some type of huge blessing in our life that we would look at as blessing. But you know that sometimes he allows discouragement. Sometimes he allows even some tragedies in our life for us to be able to resound to his glory. Um, John Piper made the comment in one of his books, in, in Don't Waste Your Life, he made the comment how that he said that, that God wants to be glorified in our living and in our dying. And you know, and whenever I came across that when I was reading that book, I was like, well, okay, you know, I was trying to get my head around that, and I was like, well, okay, glorified in our living, yes, okay, I get that, he wants to, but when we're dead, we're, we're dead. <laughs> so how's he going to be glorified through our dying? Through his dying, absolutely. We're, we can be saved through it. But then, you know, it wasn't very long afterwards, um, participated in a funeral. And at that funeral, uh, an invitation was given, and there was at least three people that got saved. Oh. And the Lord really spoke to my heart through that. Because even, even at a funeral service, God was glorified even through our dying. Right. So, it's also, the second thought is, is to be able, the secret is to rest in your situation. We're always, we're, we're creatures of habit, we're also creatures of want. Mm. Of wanting the next best thing. Mm. But to be able to realize what we have, to be able to be thankful for what we have, and, and that there is always someone worse off than we are. But what the Lord has given to us to be thankful people. We mention that so often, but one of the greatest sins of, of the people of Israel in the, in the Old Testament was, was the sin of ungratefulness or unthankfulness. You know, it was a blessing. Last night, um, whenever we got home, and uh, Kaylee would not get out of my arms. She was sitting in my lap the whole night, and... Uh, and uh, Deanna, or Savannah had come up to me and as we left early on Thursday morning and, and, uh, I did, and I told her bye and whatnot, but I guess she didn't really realize that, that I was leaving at that point. And so anyways, last night she came up to me and started uh, tearing up. And she said, you know, she said, uh, whenever, uh, whenever you told me bye the other day, she said, I didn't realize you were actually leaving. And uh, she started crying and whatnot just because she missed her dad. But you know, I started thinking about that, and you know, it's a blessing to be able to realize, you know, in each one of our lives, we think about different things that, man, I wish you had this, I wish you had that. That was a great reminder last night for me. To be thankful for the things that the Lord has given to us. Most of the time, and for me anyway, it's my children teach me the greatest lessons. Mm -hmm. But what a blessing it is, you know, to be able to realize that the contentment, you know, can come in, it's always the small things that the Lord gives us, that always in the end uh, gives us the true blessings. It's not always the big things, but to be thankful for what the Lord's given to us. And then also to realize where your strength comes from. And it's not in yourself. Uh, I mentioned the other week, I think that every time that I get sick, it seems it's a great reminder for me that my strength's not in myself, it's in the Lord. Right. I'm sure every one of you that have been ill lately say the same thing. It's in the Lord. Right. It's in Christ and Him alone. There in um, Philippians chapter, chapter 4 and, um, and verse 13, Philippians uh, chapter 4 there and um, verse 13. 
It says, again, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Notice there's not anything about me except for the one who's being strengthened. So God is the one doing the strengthening. There's nothing I can do to strengthen myself. I can't wish strength upon myself. It's God that brings that strength into our life. And here, I just want to look at one other portion here. And so we think about that as far as the strength comes from the Lord. And the last verse I want to look at this morning, for time's sake, is in Philippians chapter 4 there. Notice verses 6 and 7. Same, same chapter, just a few verses beforehand. And he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, which surpasses all understanding, and will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So here, as we're, as we're talking about what is it that brings us true satisfaction and, and what um, allows us to be totally content, I think this is one of the greatest portions of Scripture on that subject. And notice that again in verse 6. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Where is that contentment going to come from? We would say that it's through Jesus Christ, it's through Him, but it's also, you know, in, in relationship to Him, in a relationship to Him. You know, if I were to ask you, and I'm not going to do that, which on the spot, if I were to ask you this morning, how many in here would raise your hand to say that, yes, I'm a Christian, and that means a Christ-like one. But yet then we stop and think about our lives and 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 does but does Christ truly know us? That's the bigger question. We might say that, you know, I, I know Christ as my Savior, but how much is does Christ truly know us? And then, and it really it goes both ways. And then coming back to our part, how much are we truly becoming like Christ? How much are we truly spending the time with him? Can he truly say that, yes, Justin is a Christian? Yes, Justin is a Christ-like one. And so that's really what it comes back to. And here, once again, in these verses, he, uh, Paul's again talking here. And he's, he's saying, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. This verse is not going to apply to us if we're not having a relationship with Him. He wants to hear us. He wants us to come before Him. He wants us to be able to bring our petitions before Him. And also, and it's not just the things, but you notice there at the, in the middle of verse 6, He says, with thanksgiving. You know, I stopped and I was... You know, I was, talk, I was thinking about it the other day. I mentioned it to Alan. I said, you know, uh, um, it, it's troubling at times whenever we have more prayer requests for health needs than for our own family souls. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to ask that question, but how many of you in here this morning have family members who are unsaved? Mm -hmm. And we have a whole list of in the, of. of a sheet of, of uh, health needs. And I'm not <laughs> knocking that. Trust me. They're all needful. But when's the last time that we prayed for our, even our own families wow. to be saved? Wow. We have more of a burden at times for, for a cold or for a, a pneumonia to be lifted than a spiritual situation going on in the life. And even with this aspect of thanksgiving, we would say that it's a blessing to be able to realize that God is the one that does this. Mm -hmm. He's the one that gives us this heart. And, and, and to be able to not only come before him with prayer and supplication, but also to come before him in thanksgiving for what he is doing. 
And then he goes on and says, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. This is that attitude and that aspect of contentment. He says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Why is he worded like this? Because it doesn't make sense. Just like we were reading earlier, Paul, even in the midst of, he was writing from prison. Was he just insane? No. He found that his contentment was not in his surroundings. His contentment was found in Jesus Christ. Whether he was suffering loss or whether he was in, in a, a great day in his life, he had the same contentment because it wasn't in his surroundings. It wasn't in his place in life, but it was only found in Jesus Christ. And then he says, what surpasses all understanding, this will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So once again, here in conclusion, we would say that it's our hearts and minds. This is what needs to be renewed. This is, these, is what needs to be strengthened. And my heart was strengthened. My mind was strengthened this week. And, and, and it's like Al and I were talking about that one evening there was that, you know, a lot of the things we heard, it wasn't necessarily anything new. We just need to be constantly reminded of God's truths and what a blessing it is. And it should be a blessing every time we hear his word. In conclusion, I just want to read this just briefly. I came across this and very applicable. And, we add, and this goes right along with the question, where do you run for or run to for a true contentment? And this is a true uh, story. It was, in, uh, it was in West Texas during the Depression in the 1930s. Uh, there was an individual named Yates Poole. And, uh, and, he, uh, and, and he, had a, he had a sheep ranch owned by a man um, named... Um, uh, by his dad, Ira Poole, that, that his dad passed away, and then this Yates uh, basically took it over. And it says, because of Yates' inability to make enough money on his ranching operation to make his mortgage payment, he was in danger of losing his ranch. With little money for clothes or food, his family, like many others during the Depression years, had to live on government subsidy. Day after day, Yates would watch his sheep as they grazed over those rolling West Texas hills. He would rack his brain trying to figure out some way to pay all of his bills. One day, a crew of men from an oil company came into the area and convinced Yates that there might be oil on this land. They asked permission to drill a wildcat test well. Yates agreed and signed a lease contract. At 1,115 feet, the driller struck a huge oil reserve. The first well came in at 80,000 barrels a day. But that was only the beginning. Many more uh, wells came in, some more than twice as productive as the first. In the 60s, after oil had been pumped for more than 30 years, a government test of just one of the wells showed that it still had a potential flow of 125,000 barrels of oil a day. In the year 2000, Yates Field was still one of the top 10 producers of oil in the United States. And it says in conclusion, and to think that one time sheep rancher Yates owned it all. When Yates purchased the ranch, he was more interested in grazing land for his sheep than he was in the oil and mineral rights. There he was, living on government subsidy, but sitting on a mammoth underground lake of incredible, uh, valuable oil. He was a potential million, multi-millionaire living in poverty. What was his problem? It was simple, that he just did not know that the oil was there. And you stop and think about that, and as I, I came across that article the other day, and I stopped and thought about that, I said, you know, the only reason that he didn't do anything about it or didn't change his standing in life was because he wasn't digging. And you stop and think about that in our lives, applying this uh, example to our lives. You know, sometimes we just try to get it by, and, and even in Christianity, 
in our Christian life with just basically the crumbs. And what the Lord wants is for us to dig even further to be able to see the, the mines of truth that he has for us. To be able to dig those nuggets up for ourselves. And here, and this is exactly going back to that text here as we end in Philippians 4. He says, but be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so we would say that that true contentment is going to only be found, I would say, in, in the mind of Jesus Christ. Digging and finding the truths that he has for us in him. And I pray this morning that um, not only that you know him, but that you have a heart that wants to know him even more. And I would say if you don't, to be asking the Lord for it. And you know what the blessing is? He'll give it to us. Wow. He wants to. And that's the, that's the whole truth of it. That's the whole blessing of the Christian life. Is he wants us to be able to get to know him more. Mm -hmm. So we would encourage you to be able to do so. And we're going to have a time of invitation. And uh, ask the Lord just to do a work in our hearts. Continue to. And, and maybe if there's some things maybe that the Lord has spoken to your heart about even this morning. Even through these testimonies. And through his word. To be able to come before him. To ask him to be able to do a work in your heart as well. Let's close the word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your, for your word. Thank you, Father, for these truths. And thank you for uh, these testimonies this morning of how that you, you've worked. And we know that this is uh, not just a flash of the pain that you want from us, but you want us to be able to uh, dig for your truths, your Father, each and every day that you give to us. I pray that you just speak to our hearts again, Father, in a real and genuine way. And I pray that even during this invitation time, that you uh, speak to our hearts as only you can. And uh, we'll give you the praise for it. We ask these things in Jesus. Amen. Well, if you would uh, stand, and we're going to turn to page, uh, page number 270. Page 270, just as I am. <coughs> Father, for each one of these testimonies that we've heard this morning. And 
And ultimately, dear Father, we're thankful for the work that you do in our hearts. And uh, we know, dear Father, that it, we wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for your mercy, it wasn't for your grace. And I pray that we would live lives, dear Father, of not just out of pure obedience, but because of we love you, dear Father, with all of our heart. And I pray if there be here one here this morning that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray, dear Father, that you would speak to that heart and help them to understand it. They need you, Father, as a Savior and Lord in the life. There truly is no other contentment in this world but you. And I pray, dear Father, that you'd help that to be to ring true in each one of our lives as we leave here today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.